Welcome to the video walkthrough of the Data Visualization 101 Lunch and Learn. My name is Vishal Bakshi and I'm an organizer of the PyData PDX Meetup. In this video, I'll first list the references I used as they strongly dictate the contents in this presentation. Then I'll define data visualization, talk about what it means to design for an audience, go over some fundamental concepts of graphical perception, and then as one example of structured data, review a data type taxonomy. I'll start with this quote by statistician and data visualization expert Nathan Yao. Learn all you can about your data before anything else, and your analysis and visualization will be better for it. You can then pass on what you know on to readers. In preparation for this lunch and learn, I first read through the data points Visualization That Means Something by Nathan Yao, which is an effective and accessible summary of data visualization concepts and guidelines. Then I read the research paper Graphical Perception, Theory, Experimentation, and Application to the Development of Graphical Methods by William S. Cleveland and Robert McGill, where some of the fundamental guidelines for data visualizations were established. I referenced the paper, The Eyes Have It, a task by Data Type Taxonomy for Information Visualizations by Ben Schneiderman, which walks through the history of information visualization within the framework of common user tasks, data types, and user problems, which those visualizations help overcome. Lastly, Allison Slider, senior data scientist at Digimark and an organizer at PyDataPDX, gave a presentation at a WIDS conference titled Presenting Data to Non-Analysts, How to Make an Impact on All Kinds of Audiences, which gives helpful guidelines on how to make your data presentation effective for diverse ranges of audiences. So what is data visualization. It's one part of the broader topic of data presentation, which is the method by which your data conclusions get communicated to your audience. Nathan Yao presents this framework to explain the process of data visualization, which is an organic dynamic between the real world, the data we collect on it, and the shapes and colors we encode that information with that the audience decodes using their visual perception. The real world is the full data set. It has the full context within which dynamic interactions of life take place. The data we collect is an abstraction of the real world, so we must use rigorous, proper methods of experiment design and sampling and data collection in order to abstract the real world while maintaining useful context for our particular application or study. The shapes and colors we use to encode the data is an abstraction of the data. That means that when we look at a data visualization, we are observing the result of at least two abstractions of the real world that visualization is supposed to represent. Nathan Yao states, data is more than numbers, and to visualize it, you must know what it represents. Data represents real life. It's a snapshot of the world in the same way that a photograph captures a small moment in time. With that being said, we'll now talk about how to design a data presentation for an audience. Allison Slider states, I am fully reliant on my audience. I need the questions my audience brings to me. Step one is reminding ourselves how dependent we are on our audience. Step two is making sure you can get what you need from your audience to do your job well. I'll continue to use Nathan Yao's framework to explore the guiding principles of designing for an audience. The first question lives in the real world. Who is my audience? Answering this question requires me to understand something about what my audience will or will not understand. What experiences do they have with this domain? 
with understanding data. What are their interests, goals, and values? I need to understand their context. Once I understand my audience, I need to understand the data, starting with what do we already know? What are the questions that need to be asked? And to whom should we ask those questions? This leads us to a framework presented by Anne Kerwin in 1993 in her research paper titled None Too Solid, Medical Ignorance, where she states, if, however, we are to cope with our vast ignorance of the human body, its power and processes, we must learn to acknowledge our nescience and optimize it. To do so, we need to rethink the nature and interrelations between knowledge and ignorance. The types of questions we ask address one of these quadrants. On the horizontal axis, we have knowledge. The left side represents things we know, and on the right, we have things we don't know. On the vertical axis, we have awareness. The top represents things we are aware of, and the bottom represents things we are not aware of. In the first quadrant, we can explore questions around things we are aware we know. Maybe we want to verify, clarify, or deepen our understanding of that knowledge. The second quadrant is where we can explore questions to address our conscious ignorance, things we are aware that we don't know. For example, I was aware that I didn't know who came up with this framework, so I could address that with a question, or in this case, a query to a search engine. In the third quadrant, we have meta-ignorance, or things we are unaware we don't know. Generally speaking, the more I know about a topic, the more awareness I gain around how much I don't know. But that awareness is always increasing, and the amount I don't know is usually exponentially increasing. So I judge that I'm usually unaware of what I don't know. This is why a beginner's mind and curiosity are critical as students of any field. In the fourth and final quadrant are things we are unaware we know, or tacit knowledge. These are things that are second nature to you that may be difficult to explain. For example, I speak English, but I don't know enough about linguistics, psychology, physiology, and neuroscience to explain with any tangible details how my brain and body work together when I speak. The questions I can explore here may require conversations with people who have some understanding of my context so that they can help me move to quadrant one. Let's now go back to the questions that we should ask in order to design for an audience that is not ourselves. What is the context that needs to be encoded into our abstractions? In other words, what will the audience understand about the real world based on the data we collected and the shapes and colors they decode? This is an iterative process and may require many rounds of asking questions, understanding the real world a bit more, and collecting more or different data. We want to make our first abstraction of the real world and collect or find collected data for our analysis. What resources do I have access to? Can I collect this data myself, or is there data out there which fulfills the needs of my audience and the context I want to capture? If I'm using an existing data set, who collected this data and how did they collect it? What does the data represent in this world? Does it make sense? How does it relate to other data? When, where, and why was the data collected? How do I know if it's any good? What does good data mean? It's important to emphasize that the process of data visualization involves statistical analysis. Next, when choosing the shapes and colors we encode the data in, we keep in mind that the goal is for your audience to understand the data. 
follow guidelines, but not as rules. Try out different visualizations and compare them and balance functionality and uniqueness. A simple bar chart may be sufficient, or an embellished chart with illustrations incorporated into data elements may be more effective. Or sometimes you just need to present a few numbers or a table instead of a visualization. The process is iterative. We'll now look closer at how the audience perceives visualizations and introduce graphical perception. In their paper on graphical perception, Cleveland and McGill state that the subject of graphical methods for data analysis and for data presentation needs a scientific foundation. In this article, we take a few steps in the direction of establishing such a foundation. Graphical perception is the visual decoding of information encoded on graphs. Using the same Nathan Yao framework as before, decoding is done by the audience when they interpret what the shapes and colors of the visualization say about the data and what that data says about the real world. Encoding is what the data scientist does. The data encodes something about the real world, which is then encoded in shapes and colors on the chart. We use different visual cues to encode our data. The vertical and horizontal position on scatter plots encode different value attributes of the data, as does the length of a bar on a bar chart or the angle of a pie chart region. The direction of a line segment on a line chart, for example, encodes a change in magnitude. The area of different circles represents a value attribute. Saturation can also encode values, as can different hues. In general, position that is aligned to the same set of axes is the most accurate visual cue, while encoding values with hues is the least accurate. These are of course only guidelines in isolation and may not apply to your context. However, it's important to understand what our audience accurately decodes. In the final section of this video, I'll walk through a discussion on data type taxonomy as presented by Ben Schneiderman, who presents seven data types, 1D, 2D, 3D, temporal, meaning related to time, multidimensional, meaning more than three dimensions, tree, and network. He also presents seven high-level tasks that people need to perform when interacting with data, which are to gain an overview of the entire collection, zoom in on items of interest, filter out uninteresting items, select an item or group and get details when needed, view relationships among items, keep a history of actions to support undo, replay, and progressive refinement, and allow extractions of subcollections and of the query parameters. It's important to note that the data we encounter in the real world is initially unstructured. We have to apply a structure to it in order to collect that data in formats we can use for analysis. Therefore, these examples are not exhaustive, nor are they constraining. Each example given can be structured differently. One-dimensional data can be thought of as a collection of items where each item is a line of text with different attributes. For example, a file code can be thought of as one-dimensional with each line having different attributes, such as date and time it was written, author, and whether it was added, modified, or removed. In 1982, one-dimensional data visualization was explored using a bifocal display, where the data of interest was presented on a flat surface normal to the viewer's line of sight. However, the broader context was captured with receding surfaces that blurred details but allowed the user to understand their location 
within the full collection. In 1993, the document lens achieved a similar result for a collection of documents. One document was focused and legible, whereas the rest of the documents were intentionally distorted in order to allow the focus to stay on the single document while providing broader context. In 1995, the information mural was developed to show one-dimensional data, in this case, the number of daily sunspot observations over time. Here, the average monthly sunspots are plotted on a line chart. The information mural does not require aggregation as it plots all daily observations with varying hue to encode density. Here, the periodicity of the observations is present along with the frequency variations within the full data set. Two-dimensional data can be a collection where each item covers some part of the total area and has attributes that can be used for some analysis task such as understanding the name, owner, and value of an item, as well as attributes used as features for the interface, such as the size, color, and opacity of the item. In 1992, this geographic information system was developed to encode different attributes, such as recreational items and municipal boundaries and roads, onto a two-dimensional map. Three-dimensional data can be a collection where each item has volume and therefore potentially complex relationships with other items. In 1996, the Visible Human Project was a visualization tool created to allow people to explore the three-dimensional human body mapped onto two sets of two-dimensional images. As the viewer scrolled up and down the vertical cross-section the panel on the side displayed the corresponding horizontal cross-section to visualize the third dimension. Temporal data can be a collection where each item has a start and finish time that may overlap with other items. In 1993, the perspective wall was created to visualize the status of files over time. The vertical position encodes different file formats, and the horizontal position encodes time. Multidimensional data can be a collection where each item has n attributes, can be a part of a pattern or cluster, may have correlations with other items, may be an outlier, or may be missing from the collection. In 1994, the Film Finder visualized multiple dimensions of movies, such as popularity, date of release, title, actor, actress, director, length, ratings, and genre. Tree data can be a collection where each item has a relationship to other items, either parent or child and can have multiple attributes. In 1995, the tree browser visualized this parent-child relationship and encoded different attributes with hue. Finally, network data can be a collection where each item can be linked to an arbitrary number of other items. In 1995, a visualization of the internet show websites as nodes and hyperlinks as edges. I'll end with a quote by Nathan Yao, who states that good visualization is a winding process that requires statistics and design knowledge. Without the former, the visualization becomes an exercise only in illustration and aesthetics and without the latter, one of only analyses. On their own, these are fine skills, but they make for incomplete data graphics. Having skills in both provides you with the luxury, which is growing into a necessity, to jump back and forth between data exploration and storytelling. 
This framework illustrates this point with the process of encoding taking us from the real world to data to shapes and colors with statistics and design knowledge so that the audience can go interpret those shapes and colors and learn something accurate and correct about the data and the real world it represents. Thanks for watching this video. We'll have the walkthrough for Data Visualization 102 and 103 posted in the near future. Follow us on Twitter at PyDataPDX and attend one of our events on meetup.com slash pydata-pdx.